Okay, John chapter 9, are we there? John chapter 9. Today, uh, you know, and I love John's gospel. John's gospel is amazing because John is a master storyteller. He, he really is masterful in, in telling the story about Jesus. And he makes this story come alive to us, uh, really this whole story of Jesus. And John's gospel is really the story of Jesus' life. But John makes it come alive to us. And, and he makes it so vibrant as he talks about his friend and his Savior, Jesus Christ. Today in chapter 9, we're going to see that Jesus is going to heal a man who was born blind. A man who's never seen light, who's never seen color, who's never seen the, his, the face of his mother. Jesus is going to heal a blind man. And as wonderful as this is, not everyone embraces what Jesus has done. Can you imagine that? That as wonderful as it is that Jesus performs this incredible miracle, it actually ticks some people off. And the story it begins with Jesus healing somebody's physical eyes, but it ultimately culminates in Jesus healing this blind man's spiritual eyes. He opens his eyes spiritually. And so today we're going to see that, yes, Jesus has the power to heal all of our infirmities, but he also has the power to heal us emotionally and spiritually. Let's pray, and we're going to jump right in today. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for the time of worship that we've had. Lord, I thank you for this church family that we gather together week after week to be encouraged, to be strengthened, to be corrected, to be convicted, Lord. God, I pray that as we read your word today, that these would not be just words on a page, but that your spirit would make it come alive to our hearts. God, that your word would impact our lives Lord, where we need to be strengthened, that we would be strengthened. Where we need to be encouraged, that you would encourage us today. God, if we have sin in our lives, God, I pray that you would convict us of it and empower us by your spirit to have the victory from it. In all of these things, God, we want to live in such a way that brings glory to the name of your son, Jesus Christ. It's, his, his, it's in his name that we ask these things. Amen. Now, today I'm going to read the whole passage because I want us to get a feeling for the flow of this story, and then quickly I'm going to come back through and um, highlight some things that I think the Lord wants us to look at today, and then we're going to respond by receiving communion, the Lord's Supper, today. Okay, John chapter 9, verse 1. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, it just looks like him. He kept saying to them, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made the mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought him to the Pharisees. They brought the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees asked again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. 
the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. These guys are persistent. <laughs> they really want to get to the bottom of this. And, he asked, and they asked the parents, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now, how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess that Jesus is the Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time they came and called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. But one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes? We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin and would teach us, and they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees heard him say these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. I love the Bible. I love the Bible because it's an honest book. It's the most honest book that's ever been written in the history of the world. And the Bible paints for us a picture of what life is really like. The Bible doesn't try and deceive us and, and paint for us a picture that is not accurate from what we see playing out in the rest of the world. The Bible paints for us what we see actually taking place in reality every day. And so it's incredibly relevant for our lives because it honestly speaks to our lives. And we see at the beginning of this chapter a man and his family who are suffering. A man who was born blind. This, these parents had come together in union, in marriage. God had blessed their marriage with a baby. They had brought him forth in joy, only to find out the utter disappointment that their son could not see. You can begin to sense the, the weight, of the burden that would have fallen upon their shoulders not that they loved their child any less, but that they realized the hardship that lay before him and them raising a child who would never see. Hardship had so befallen them that the parents were no longer able to take care of their children, to, to take care of their child, and they had sent him out into the street to beg. We see that the Bible doesn't paint for us a, a distorted picture. It's actually an honest picture 
of what life is like sometimes. In life, we all go through seasons of hardship, of difficulty, of of suffering. But what I love is that Jesus, as he passes by, it says that he saw the man. That Jesus takes notice, that Jesus, even in our pain, he sees it. He takes notice of it. Jesus doesn't walk by on the other side of the road and ignore this blind man. It's Jesus who notices him. It's Jesus who sees him. And today, I want you to know that if you're in a difficult season, that Jesus sees what you're going through. God is not indifferent to our pain or our sorrow. God cares. God cares what we go through in life. He cares when our hearts are broken. He cares when our emotions are scarred. I've been through seasons of wondering, God, do you know? God, do you care? Do you see what I'm going through? Where are you? And all of us in life will go through seasons like that. And I love that the Bible is honest about that. It doesn't try to paint for us a picture that would deceive us. And God does care. God sees this man. He's not like us. Who? How many times do we see people who are hurting and we look the other way? People that we could help alleviate some of their pain. Maybe it's emotional, maybe it's physical, maybe it's financial, and we look the other way. Jesus doesn't look the other way. Jesus takes notice. Jesus is the one who sees this man blind from birth. The disciples, as they stop with Jesus looking at this blind man, they ask a question. And it's not unlike many of the questions we ask ourselves. They say, whose fault is it that this man was born blind? Was it that his parents sinned or that somehow he sinned in the womb, if such a thing is possible? Why, is this, why was this man born blind? They're looking for a reason. They're looking for the cause of this man's blindness. And those of us who have been through hardship, we would all be lying if we said we did not ask why. Why did I go through this? Why am I having to face this? And the disciples ask the same question. But Jesus says, and I want you to get this, this is so important to our faith every single day. Jesus says it was not that this man sinned or that his parents sinned but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus is saying that you can't point back to some specific sin that his dad did when he was 15 that now caused him to be born blind. God was not punishing the parents by giving them a child that was born blind. In fact, God said it's, or Jesus said it's because of God's purpose That he was born this way. How can this be? How can this be? You see, God has an eternal purpose that we cannot see. God has an eternal purpose that he's working out in each one of our lives every single day that we do not see. It's a plan and a purpose that the Bible says started before he even created the world. God's plan and purpose is in effect in your life. But we don't see it. His ways, Isaiah says, are not our ways. His thoughts are so far higher than our thoughts. And in this story, we get to see a glimpse of the nature and the character of God as the Redeemer, as God, as the one who has the eternal purpose. In this story, we get to see the eternal purpose of God, the curtain pulled back on it just a little bit, and we can perceive and peer into God's eternal purpose in this blind man. And because of that, we can take to heart God's eternal purpose for this blind man. The man and his parents we see at the end of the story received an eternal reward 
that far outweighed their temporary suffering. The man and his parents received a reward that far outweighed any temporary suffering or discomfort that they had faced. And the Apostle Paul puts it this way, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. In this life, we will have suffering. The Bible does not hide that fact from us. And in fact, as children of God and as followers of Jesus, there is a price to pay and a cause. The Bible says to count the cost before we follow Jesus because there is a price to pay. But that price is nothing in comparison to the glory that will be revealed in us to the eternal purpose when it's finally unfolded, when our faith becomes sight, there will be not a one of us saying, God, I was shortchanged. God, the price I paid was too high. Not a single one of us will be able to utter those words. Instead, we will be like this blind man who fall at the feet of Jesus and say, God, I see now. I see. Romans 8, 28, my favorite verse in the whole Bible. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. This is faith. Believing in God, even though and even when our natural circumstances don't, don't show it to us. That is faith. Faith is not twisting God's arm behind his back and forcing him to get you, give you whatever you want. That's not faith. That's idolatry. Faith is saying, God, I believe you, even though in the natural it doesn't seem like things are going the way I would want them to go. Faith is saying, I see with the eyes of the Spirit what I don't see with my physical eyes. And this is the promise that we all have as God's children. That God is going to work all things for my good. So if you're suffering today, I want you to know that it's not because God doesn't love you. If you're suffering today, I want you to know that it's not necessarily because of some sin in your life. Jesus was perfect. Jesus was without sin. Jesus was in the bosom of the Father from all eternity. God loved Jesus more than anybody. Yet Jesus suffered and died. So suffering does not necessarily mean that God doesn't love us. Suffering doesn't mean that we've sinned. Jesus was without sin. Yet Jesus endured suffering. Why? Because of the joy that was before him. And so today, if you're going through a difficult season of hardship or suffering, God's word to you today is endure for the joy that is set before you. This is a promise for all of us as God's children. He is going to work our situations for our good. I don't know when. I don't know how. It's in his eternal purpose. But God's word to you today is to hold on to him and his promise and his purpose. James 1 says, count it all joy when you fall into suffering. What? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Is this come some kind of sick joke? What are you talking about? Count it all joy. Why? Because the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, patience, and that it perfects you. That as your faith is being tested, God is perfecting you. God is working on you. God is working in you and for you. Something greater than you could ever imagine. Faith is saying, God, I believe you even when I don't see it with my physical eyes. I want to see four reactions today by four different groups of people. If you like taking notes, you're going to love this today. Reaction number one, the neighbors. They react with surprise and skepticism. We see this in verse nine. Some said, wow, this is amazing. This man has been healed. Others said, no, it's just his lookalike. He wasn't really healed. This is just somebody that looks like him. You know, sometimes when we share the good things that God has done for us, people are skeptical. People kind of look back at us and say, what? I don't know about this. I don't know if, if Jesus can be that good. 
you've drank in some kind of Kool-Aid, and ah, this is, you're, I don't know what you're into. Have you ever received a reaction like that? You tell somebody about the good things that God has done, and they kind of look at you like, have you lost it? The second reaction we see is from the Pharisees, and we can predict what they're going to do. They react in disbelief and in prejudice. Verse 18, it says that the, 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 the blind, blind man was standing right in front of them saying, I was healed. And they look at him and say, no, nah, I don't think so. Nah, there's, there's got to be a mix-up somewhere. You must have just thought you were blind or something. They had to go get his parents. That's how much they disbelieved. And in verse 16, what we see is a division arises between those who believed and those who didn't. Have you ever had somebody react to you in just total disbelief? You get saved, you tell them about how God's changed your life, and they look at you and they say, it's not real. You're going to be back here partying with us in two weeks. It's not going to last. It's not real. It's the reaction of the Pharisees. It's disbelief. They don't want to believe that God did something in your life. And what happens is there's a division. There is always a division between those who believe in Jesus Christ and those who don't. There's a separation that happens, and you will find that over time. That those friends, those family members that you used to be so close with, that as you get closer and closer to Jesus, there's this division that takes place. But God does not leave you alone. He brings you into his family, the church. And there's a new community. There's a new family. There's new relationships. There's new joy. And the bonds that hold us together as God's family, as God's church, are so much stronger than even the natural bonds that we have with our physical family. But there's this division that takes place. Thirdly, we see the parents. The parents actually, actually believed in Jesus, but they kept quiet because they were feared they were going to be excommunicated. They were going to be kicked out of the synagogue. How many of you, you've ever been afraid to... Share your faith to share your beliefs because you're afraid of what people are going to think of you or what the repercussions might be. How many of you ever had an experience where somebody finds out you're a Christian and they come to you and they say, hey, hey, me too, man. Wink, wink, thumbs up. You know, I'm a Christian too. You're like, really? How long have you been a Christian? Oh, I've been a Christian for 10 years. Well, why didn't you tell me about Jesus 10 years ago? What? What's this undercover Christianity that we got this secret club and handshake going? Come on. They were afraid. I think we've all known people like that. I think at times we've all been people like that. May God help us. Be bold in our faith. Fourthly, we see the blind man. And through this whole scenario, this whole situation, this whole amazing day where he received his sight... He shows a consistent and growing faith. Real quickly, I want to look at the blind man's growing faith. In verse 11, the blind man calls Jesus a man. He says, the man called Jesus healed me. He said that to his neighbors. Next, when he's called before the Pharisees, he calls Jesus a prophet in verse 17. He's growing in his faith. He's getting more bold. He's starting to figure out, hey, there's something special about this Jesus guy. In verse 33, finally, after he confesses that he was blind and now he sees, he says to the Pharisees, this is a man who was sent from God. To which they, they can't stand it and they throw him out. He has a growing faith. I love that this story starts with Jesus seeking him out. Jesus heals his physical eyes as the Pharisees put him out of the synagogue and the temple. Jesus goes looking for him. Verse 35 is Jesus heard that they cast him out and he, having found him, he said, do you believe? I want you to know today it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. Jesus Christ is looking for you. Jesus Christ wants to heal you, wants to give you new life, eternal life. Forgive your sins. The man finally professes and confesses that Jesus is Lord. And he says, I believe. In that moment of belief, his spiritual eyes were opened. He saw finally for the first time 
reality. What a day for this guy. And in that moment, his spiritual eyes were opened. I love his response. It says that he worshipped him. Why do we worship Jesus? Why do we worship Jesus? Because like this blind man, Jesus has opened our blind eyes. Worship is a response to what God has done for us. Worship is a a response to salvation. That God has opened our blind eyes. We now see. Worship is the overflow of a heart that is full of gratitude and love towards God. Because what he has done, forgiving our sins, giving us new life. The sad thing about this story is that it ends the same way it begins. The story begins with blindness, and it ends with blindness, only a worse kind. John concludes the story by contrasting the man who has received his sight and the Pharisees who were spiritually blind. John is telling us that there is a condition that is worse than physical blindness. There is an illness that is far more dangerous and deadly than simply not being able to see. It's a blindness of the heart. A hardness of the heart towards God. A spiritual blindness. A self-deception. And the Pharisees were that. They said to Jesus, are, we, are you calling us blind? We're not blind. We see perfectly clear. They were unwilling to admit their blindness. They were unwilling to admit that Jesus was the light of the world. But here's the good news. Not only does Jesus have the power to open our physical eyes, he alone is the one who can open our spiritual understanding. Not only can he open our physical eyes, not only can he heal our body, but he can Bring resurrection to our spirit and life to our soul. The key to receiving your sight is admitting that you're blind. It's admitting sin. It's repentance. It's coming to God and saying, I've made a mess of my life. And I'm putting my faith in Jesus Christ who died for my sin. So that I might live a new life. The Pharisees were unable or unwilling to admit the conditions of their hearts. So, where do you see yourself today in this story? Where do you see yourself today? There's so many places where we can see ourselves. Maybe you're in a season of of difficulty, of suffering. Man, I want you to hold on today. Hold on to God. Hold on in faith. He's not finished with you. He's not finished writing your story. The end will always be better than the beginning. There are only happy endings in the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ is returning for us. And his... Yeah, that's something to celebrate. And he promises... That every tear will be wiped from our eyes. That every hurt will be healed. And not only that, but we will be better for having gone through it. And that's only the work that God can do. And so hold on today if you're going through a difficult season. Maybe you see yourself in the skeptical neighbors who didn't believe a miracle had taken place. Maybe you're kind of on the outside looking at the church and wondering what all this is about. Maybe you're like the parents who believed in Jesus but were afraid to say so publicly. Hopefully you're not like the Pharisees who couldn't be more blind yet refused to admit it. I pray to God that we're all, all, we're all like this blind man on our journey of faith, more moving towards worshiping Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord. May we all be able to proclaim one thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. Why don't we stand this morning?